cow-shaped earth continued. My dear king, I am just like a strong boat, and all the paraphernalia of the world is standing upon me. If you break me to pieces, how can you protect yourself and your subjects from drowning? Report by Srila Prabhupada. Beneath the entire planetary system is the Garba water. Lord Vishnu lies on this Garba water, and from his abdomen a lotus stem grows, and all the planets within the universe are floating in the air, being supported by this lotus stem. If a planet is destroyed, it must fall into the water of Garba. The earth, therefore, warned King Pritu that he could gain nothing by destroying her. Indeed, how could he protect himself and his citizens from drowning in the Garba water? In other words, outer space may be compared to an ocean of air, and each and every planet is floating on it, just as a boat or island floats on the ocean. Sometimes planets are called dwipa, or islands, and sometimes they, are, uh, sometimes they are called boats. Thus, the cosmic manifestation is partially explained in this reference by the cow-shaped earth. So we have another cosmological verse. Um, the earth is speaking to King Pritu, who is threatening to destroy her. And so in the purport, Srila Prabhupada refers to the Garba water. So in this verse, water is referred to, Ambasi in the water, and Srila Prabhupada refers to that as the uh, Garba water or the Garbadak ocean. So the uh, cosmology of the universe is described in the fifth canto. Basically, the geometry of the situation is like this. If you imagine a sphere uh, four billion miles in diameter, that's quite a large sphere from the perspective of uh, life here on the Earth. Um, to get an idea of how big that is, it's about the diameter of the uh, orbit of Uranus. If you know the planets, you have uh, Jupiter and Saturn and then Uranus. So the diameter of the orbit of Uranus is about four billion miles. It's a bit less, actually, but it's close to that. So imagine a sphere four billion miles in diameter. Now, outside of that sphere, you have elemental coverings. Uh, seven of them. Uh, within the sphere, uh, there are two divisions. Uh, cutting across the sphere, you could say across the equator, if you imagine the equator of the sphere, there is a disk, a flat plate, and that is also four billion miles in diameter, so it touches the uh, sphere around the edges. And that uh, disk is called Bhumandala. Uh, Bhumandala means the uh, circle of the earth, basically. A mandala is a circle or a circular figure, and Bhu refers to the earth. So uh, you have the earth being described as a disk uh, four billion miles in diameter. Now in the center of this disk, which is also within this, at the center point of the sphere, there is Jambudweep. Uh, Jambudweep is described as a uh, also a disk, but that one is uh, 800,000 miles in diameter. So now that's quite small compared to 4 billion. Uh, 800,000 miles in diameter, that's about the size of the sun, if you want to make a comparison to the, the modern figures. So, in the center of this Jambudweep, there is Mount Meru. Surrounding Jambudweep, there is an ocean, which is the uh, saltwater ocean. And that is like a ring surrounding Jambudweep. And that has a uh, width of uh, 800,000 miles also. <clears throat> 
And then surrounding that, there's a dwipa. It's called Plaksha Dweep. And that's a ring also that surrounds the saltwater ocean. And that ring is, uh, well, twice as thick. So that would be, uh, well, 1,600,000 uh, yojanas in uh, width. And then surrounding that, there's another ocean. I forget which one. It's probably the sugarcane juice. There are oceans of different substances. So uh, you've got uh, salt water to begin with. At least that's familiar to us. And then there's sugarcane juice. There's an ocean of liquor. Uh, I don't know what happens to the denizens there. There's an ocean of, uh, of ghee, an ocean of milk, uh, ocean of fresh water, and so on. Uh, yogurt. Did I leave out yogurt? So, actually, there, um, there was a British um, sort of bigwig in, in India in the time of the British Raj in India who uh, totally dismissed all Sanskrit literature on the basis of these oceans. He said, uh, well, in this Sanskrit literature, we have geography with uh, oceans of treacle, he used the term treacle. <laughs> I guess that refers to yogurt. <laughs> and uh, oceans of liquor. And so uh, how can we give any credence to this whole thing? This is ridiculous. So he therefore said that uh, Sanskrit education should not be supported. And uh, only English should be taught in the schools. So this was actually a pivotal point in the, in the history of the uh, colonial period in India. But anyway, so there are these successive rings, and there are seven of them, uh, counting Jambudweep as the first. It's actually a disc, not a ring. Jambudweep and six rings, which are called dweepas, and they are surrounded in turn by seven oceans. Uh, so, and as you go out from dweepa to dweepa, the width doubles each time, so they become quite large. And then beyond that, there are some additional rings going out to the boundary of the uh, Jambudweep. So this is the uh, description. The uh, set of seven oceans and dweepas, uh, that's called uh, Sapta Dweep, meaning seven dweepas. This term dweepa is generally translated as island. Uh, specifically, it would mean an island with two sides, because dwi is two and apa is water. So it's got water on two sides. And you can see if you have a ring and there's an ocean on the inside and an ocean on the outside, then it has water on two sides. So that's this term, uh, dwipa. Um, so the earth is this whole thing. That's how the Earth is described. And significantly, the Earth here is, you could say, about the size of the solar system. If you look at modern astronomy, you say, well, what does this compare with? Um, it's about the, the same size as the solar system. Now, the, um, the question now is, where is this? Earth. It's uh, 4 billion miles in diameter. It's pretty big. So where is it? Well, we're presumably standing on part of it. But uh, if you consider that wherever we're standing, let's say we're standing in the center, then going out to the edge would be 2 billion miles, which is quite a distance. Now keep in mind that the Earth we know is a globe. And if you go around the equator of the globe, it's about 25,000 miles. So compare that with going out to the edge and traveling 2 billion miles. So we're talking about something a bit different from the, the globe of the Earth as we know it. So um, the uh, key to understanding where this is actually is based on the orbit of the sun. I've talked about that before. I won't go into it in detail now. But basically, this disk is on a tilt like this. 
Uh, it extends overhead uh, and also beneath our feet in a, in a great circle surrounding where we are. Basically, it corresponds to where the sun goes. So if you consider the path followed by the sun, that's where this Bhumandala is in space. Now, everything to the north of that is outer space and higher planetary systems going up to the pole star, which would be about in that direction, at about a 30 degree angle up from the, the horizon. And early in the morning, you can see the pole star. It's always in the same direction. And that's the direction of Dhruva Loka. So um, on the opposite side of this Blue Mandala disk, everything to the south of that, which would, in this case, north means to the pole star, so south means the opposite way. So south would mean that direction. So everything to the south is the Garbodak Ocean. So this whole introduction was to indicate where the Garbodak Ocean is. Basically, if you take this sphere of the Brahmanda, half of that is the, the Garbodak Ocean, and the other half would be outer space. Now, of course, whatever direction we look in, we see stars and planets and so forth. That is, we're looking into outer space uh, in all directions. Um, we don't see an ocean. If half of outer space was filled with an ocean, obviously you wouldn't see stars in half of the directions in which you could look. Uh, presumably you'd have to see water. So this ocean is not visible to us, but um, this is where it is located. So the um, in the Bhagavatam, there's some information indicating um, how this ocean is related to the uh, lifting of the earth. Um, Srila Prabhupada quoted a section of uh, Sanskrit text, which he didn't translate, which you'll find in the, in the fifth canto. But uh, if you look into the, to what that says, um, it's a uh, text by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, uh, it describes the dimensions of these various rings that I was speaking of. And it makes an interesting modification of the calculations given in the text of the fifth canto. It makes Bhumandala slightly less than four billion uh, miles in diameter. Actually, it subtracts a distance of uh, 17,000 yojanas all the way around uh, so that there's a slight gap between Bhumandala and the uh, sphere of the Brahmanda going all the way around. And Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says that this makes it possible for Bhumandala to move up and down. Because if it had the same diameter as the sphere, then it couldn't move up and down. It would be stuck. But by making it a little bit smaller, now it can move up and down. And he says there that this allows uh, Lord Varaha to lift the earth out of the Garbodak Ocean. So if you look at the, the picture that you have, that means this entire four billion or a little bit less than four billion mile disk, if it moves down, actually it's like this. If it moves down, it moves slightly this way, and that means it's under the, the water. And if you move slightly this way, then you're pushing it above the water. And that's what was done by Varaha. So that's stated by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. So that shows the relation between this disk and the ocean. So uh, if you look in the Vishnu Purana, you'll find a more detailed description of this. And in fact, it is stated that after lifting this disk above the Garbodak Ocean, Lord Varaha restores the seven islands and uh, the seven dwipas and oceans as they were before. So it's a process of restoring these things after the annihilation caused by the flooding of the earth. So that's the basic description uh, taken uh, literally. <clears throat> 
Uh, so in this purport, Srila Prabhupada is not taking this literally. That's interesting to see that he does that. Uh, if you look at different places in the Bhagavatam, you'll find that Srila Prabhupada very often gives us a different way of looking at the earth. So I'll just uh, cite a few examples here. For example, there's the story of Arjuna and Krishna going out to see Mahavishnu. So seated on his chariot with Arjuna, Krishna began to proceed north, crossing over many planetary systems. These are described in the Srimad Bhagavatam as Sapta Dwipa. Dwipa means island. These planets are sometimes described in the Vedic literature as Dwipas. The planet on which we are living is called Jambudweep. Outer space is taken as a great ocean of air, and within that great ocean of air there are many islands, which are the different planets. In each and every planet there are oceans also. In some of the planets the oceans are of salt water, and in some of them there are oceans of milk. In others there are oceans of liquor, and in others there are oceans of ghee or oil. So that uh, is an example. So what Srila Prabhupada is saying there, instead of looking at this Bhu Mandala as a disk, he is looking at it as a system of planets which are floating in space. And he's putting the, island, the oceans on the planets. He doesn't say here how many planets there are. Of course, Saptadweep means seven planets. But um, actually, he will indicate uh, various numbers of planets. For example, according to Vedic understanding, the entire universe is regarded as an ocean of space. In that ocean, there are innumerable planets, and each planet is called a dwipa or island. So, uh, instead of taking uh, Bhumandala as a disk, he is taking it as a series of uh, dwipas. Now, there is an uh, interpretation in which Bhumandala as a whole can be understood as a, uh, as a globe. Uh, I discuss this in the uh, book that I've just produced on this subject. But basically, uh, Bhumandala is regarded as a polar projection map. Uh, just like if you look at the map there, that map is flat, but it represents a globe. And if you take the curved surface of a globe and you flatten it out onto a flat map, you're bound to get some kind of distortion somewhere. So the, the map right there is what's called a Mercator projection. And you'll see that the areas to the very far north are greatly distorted. For example, Greenland is gigantic on that map, whereas actually it's not that big. And this is due to the distortion of taking the curved surface of the Earth and flattening it to make a map. Well, another way of, this is more accurate along the equator, this particular map. Well, another way of doing it is to make the plane of your map tangent to the North Pole. Then the map is going to be accurate in the very far northern regions, but as you go way to the south, everything becomes distorted. So, uh, Bhumandala can be looked at as a planar projection map of the Earth. Now, if you look at it that way, the uh, six dwipas outside of Jambu Dweep become rings of equal latitude in the southern hemisphere. That is, you have a series of rings in the southern hemisphere corresponding to those dwipas. That description is given, for example, in a text called the Siddhanta Shiromani. So that's one way in which people have looked at the uh, Bhumandala description. But that describes Bhumandala as one planet with a series of oceans and islands, or the rings called oceans and islands, in the southern hemisphere. Uh, the lands in the northern hemisphere then would correspond to Jambudweep. But uh, Srila Prabhupada here 
is giving an interpretation in which you have many planets and you have these different oceans of ghee and liquor and so forth on different uh, planets. So now then the question is, how does this relate to the, uh, the Garbodoc Ocean? Well, if you take the plane of Bumandala and you make that into a series of planets, uh, you could just take the Garbodoc Ocean and leave that as it is, in which case the planets are going to be orbiting near the Garbodoc Ocean, and conceivably they could enter into it. So that's basically the picture that Prabhupada is giving. He mentions here in another place, only under certain conditions do the planets float as weightless balls in the air, and as soon as these conditions are disturbed, the planets may fall down into the Garbodoc Ocean, which covers half the universe. The other half is the spherical dome in which the innumerable planetary systems exist. The floating of the planets in the weightless air is due to the inner constitution of the globes. So the conception here then is you have the, the planets orbiting, and if you shift their orbits towards this southern direction, this way, then they could enter into this Garbodoc Ocean. So that would be something that the uh, modern astronomy, of course, doesn't recognize. That is, we don't see any ocean in that direction. But according to that concept, you would enter ocean moving in, in that direction. Um, there is another way to look at it, uh, and that is that if you make the disk of Bumandala into a series of planets, then likewise the ocean should be within each of the planets because you curve the surface into a sphere. So what is on one side of the sphere should go inside, and what is on the other side of the sphere should go outside. So according to that conception, then the, the ocean would be within the Earth. This actually is um, pretty much the traditional Christian interpretation of the flood story in the Bible. Uh, there's an interesting connection here, because if you look at the original cosmology in the Bible, it's the same as what you have in the Bhagavatam. Namely, you have a flat plate. The earth is on top of that, the mountains and so forth. Underneath, you have what they call tehom, which means the deep. And this means beneath the plate there is an, an ocean. That would correspond to Bumandala, and beneath Bumandala there's the Garbodoc Ocean. So if instead of a plate you make it a sphere, then you catch the ocean within the sphere. Uh, in uh, some Sanskrit texts, uh, this is explicitly done. Uh, if you look at the plate of Bumandala, Beneath that, there are seven lower planetary systems. And if you curve that plate into a sphere, the seven lower planetary systems should be within the Earth. So for example, in the uh, Surya Siddhanta, it describes the seven lower planetary systems as being within the concave strata of the Earth. So um, according to this conception then, there would be water within the Earth and if the water is released, the entire Earth becomes flooded. Uh, so that's pretty much the way the biblical flood has been typically interpreted. So that would also correspond then to inundating the Earth. Of course, if you look at it from the, the direct perspective of Bumandala as a disk and the Garbodoc Ocean, as filling half the universe, then this entire four billion mile disk would become inundated if it enters into the Garbodoc Ocean. That would mean not just the Earth, but all of the planetary systems would become uh, inundated. So uh, 
according to that understanding, then the flood would not refer simply to the, the earth alone, but to all of the planets simultaneously. So in any case, those are a few observations on this subject. I'll stop there. Are there any questions or comments? Yeah? Right. Well, you see, the uh, modern view of the solar system is that the sun is stationary in the center and the planets are orbiting around that, basically in one plane pretty close to one plane. There are slight differences. Um, the Bhagavatam refers to the sun as moving, so that's immediately a problem that people have. What I was discussing here was an even greater problem, namely the Earth being flat. <laughs> but leaving that aside, let's look at the question of the, uh, the, the sun, whether the sun is moving or stationary. Um, you can look at the sun as moving from a relative point of view. Uh, in fact, we see that happening. After all, uh, the sun rose not too long ago, and you'll see it arcing up overhead and setting. So it's a question of relative motion. And the, um, from a practical point of view, one can see the sun as moving. Uh, astronomers, including even modern astronomers, also take this point of view whenever they want to point their telescopes. Because uh, in order to know where to point your telescope, you have to consider that the telescope is on the Earth. So you have to consider how things are moving relative to the Earth. So astronomers always convert everything into what they call geocentric coordinates before actually looking in any given direction. Geocentric coordinates, that geocentric means Earth-centered. So they relate everything to the Earth. So that means then the sun is also moving relative to the Earth. So uh, this is also used in navigation. For example, uh, when the positions of the sun or the moon or different stars are used to tell a, where a ship is located on the ocean. This is all done using geocentric coordinates. So everything is looked at from the point of view of things moving relative to the, the Earth. So in practical terms, uh, the geocentric approach is still used. However, astronomers understand that in terms of the physical dynamics of the motion of the planets, the planets are moving around the sun because they're very small and lightweight compared to the sun, which is very large and massive. So uh, according to the, the physics of it, the, the planets orbit the sun. Yeah? My real question is, how do material scientists react when you give them this information? It depends on how it is presented. You see, the, uh, in the way that I just presented it, there's no contradiction. Uh, between what the scientists are saying and what the Bhagavatam is saying. Now, if I were to say, well, the scientists are all wrong, the sun is moving and the, uh, the earth is stationary, then, of course, they would dismiss that out of hand immediately as being ridiculous religious fanaticism. How can this be happening in the 20th century? That's the, the response that you would get. Um, not only scientists, but most people would respond in that way. Uh, but uh, there's no need there for uh, this to happen because, in fact, uh, it's a question of relative motion and there's no actual contradiction there. Uh, now, I've been talking, let's go back to the flat Earth. How will scientists re relate to that? Uh, if you take the description of Bhumandala literally, let's say literally, you say, well, there's this disk four billion miles in diameter. It has the oceans of ghee and liquor and uh, yogurt and so forth. 
uh, on it, and these are the following dimensions and so on, then uh, most people find it very hard to relate to that, and certainly scientists would not give it any credence. If you look at scholars in universities who study uh, old mythology, if you look at the Indologists, for example, uh, who study Sanskrit texts, they will say that uh, in the early days in India, people had a very colorful and poetic but completely unscientific picture of the universe. And that is what you find in the Bhagavatam. However, that, and that's what you get if you take the thing in a, a purely literal sense. But of course, one point that I was making here is that Prabhupada himself did not take this in a purely literal sense. And in fact, it has several different levels of meaning. Now, one observation uh, that I made was that if you look at these uh, ring-shaped dwipas that Bhumandala is divided into, you will find that uh, they correspond in size to the dimensions of the geocentric orbits of the planets. Just as the motion of the sun can be seen relative to the Earth, the same is true of the motion of each of the planets. Each planet has a geocentric orbit, and that geocentric orbit is perfectly scientific. It's just a matter of relative motion. Uh, and just to repeat again, if an astronomer points his telescope at Mars, he uses the geocentric orbit of Mars to tell where to point his telescope. He has to do that because otherwise, he, he won't point it in the right direction. So, uh, the orbits of the planets exactly fit the uh, rings of Bhumandala. This is what you find. Uh, so, there is a very close correspondence between the modern astronomical understanding of the orbits of the planets and the account of Bhumandala given in the Bhagavatam. Now, this will tend to um, seem extraordinary to scientists and scholars, not because it contradicts science, but because it agrees with science. See, the problem is, it's one thing if you contradict science. You say, the scientists are all wrong. And they'll, of course, say, no, we're not. We're right. <laughs> but if you say, well, the Bhagavatam agrees with science, that's actually a greater threat. <laughs> it's a greater threat because you're saying, well, the Bhagavatam had it first before you did. <laughs> That's a real threat. <laughs> because they want to think that everyone who came before us was primitive and very backward. But we have made the great advancement in knowledge. This is a bit mysterious, by the way, if you think about it, because the scientists themselves will say that genetically, we're the same as people were a thousand years ago or 2,000 or 3,000. In a few thousand years, our genes haven't changed because evolution is a very slow process after all. So if that's true, then our minds should be pretty much the same in terms of capacity and ability and so forth as the minds of people who lived, let's say, 5,000 years ago. Why should there be any difference? So if we can do all these scientific things today, why couldn't people do it back then? So it's a bit mysterious when they say, well, people back then were extremely crude and naive. They were very childlike in their understanding. Um, whereas today, we're extremely scientific with advanced knowledge. So anyway, the indication is that uh, people were scientific back then also. Uh, and that's the real threat to, to modern science. Yeah? Uh, in the speech, you got a description here at Bumandala. Mm-hmm. You say it was one universe. Mm-hmm. So there are many universes. Mm-hmm. So is that a description uh, effect of all universes? Well, the, um, I've been talking about what is called the Brahmanda. The sphere mm -hmm. is called the Brahmanda with Bumandala cutting across it. And I mentioned that that is said to be covered by elemental coverings. And beyond the elemental coverings, you come to the causal ocean. And beyond that, there are many other brahmandas, is the way it's described. And these are described as being like bubbles of foam 
in the ocean. So you can imagine an ocean with millions and billions of bubbles of foam. Each one of those would correspond to a, a universe. That's the conception that is given. Yeah? The state of clarification point you mentioned how the scientists say that people were signed, they were not scientific 5,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Can you clarify that how they were scientists? Oh, well, I was saying um, in the Bhagavatam, the orbits of the planets correspond to the dimensions of the, the dwipas quite accurately. Uh, so this is for all of the planets. Uh, so if this was there by deliberate understanding, that means people had to know the orbits of the planets accurately at the time when the Bhagavatam was written. Uh, so let's consider that as a possibility. Uh, if they knew that, then they must have had the same level of scientific advancement, at least, that people recently attained in the 19th century. Because if you go back to the beginning of the 19th century, you'll find that they had a somewhat inaccurate picture of how far away the sun is. And the, the distance to the sun is used as the basis for determining the distances to all the other planets. Um, at the beginning of the 19th century, their figure for the distance to the sun was about 87 million miles. Uh, it's actually more like 93 million miles. So 87 is it's in the right ballpark, but it's not very close to 93. The agreement between the orbits of the planets and the, the dwipas in the Bhagavatam is much more accurate than that. So when did they get up to about 93 million miles? Well, around the later part of the 19th century, when they managed to make better telescopes and perform more accurate measurements. So around the late, later part of the 19th century, they had what the, the Bhagavatam is indicating. So how did that get into the Bhagavatam? Well, if you go back in time, uh, Scholars today will say the Bhagavatam was written about a thousand years ago. They make everything very recent. Well, a thousand years ago, you're in the, the middle of the Middle Ages, and science was not very well developed, according to anyone's account. It was very crude, and they couldn't have made measurements like that. Um, well, we say the Bhagavatam was written five thousand years ago. Well, according to the normal scholarly and scientific way of looking at human history, 5,000 years ago, they were even more primitive than they were 1,000 years ago. Uh, of course, that's a whole subject to get into because it will be claimed that 5,000 years ago there was no civilization in India anyway. But that's a whole subject. But um, basically, that's the, the viewpoint, that people were not scientific back in those days, so they couldn't have known those distances to the planets. But the indications are that somebody knew the distances to the planets. Now, we don't know the details. It may be that people knew those things because um, higher beings came down and informed them, because we know from the Vedic literature that there was communication with beings on higher planets and so forth. So it may be that that's how they knew. They may not have had to use telescopes and so forth in order to figure it out. But the indication is that uh, people did know these kinds of things uh, thousands of years ago. But are they saying actually that those are fine saying they're bleepers? Some may say, well, it's just a wild fluke that they got this. Yeah, it's pretty wild fluke. You can, you can argue like that, that it's just coincidence. But... Um, you have a whole series of coincidences. See, that's the thing. One agreement, two things agree, you can say, well, that's a coincidence. And then two more things, well, then that's two coincidences. And you get to three, you get up to about seven or eight coincidences. Um, the thing that, that really amused me about this, you see, you have to adjust the, the length of the yojana a little bit to make everything fit. It comes to 8.5 miles to the yojana instead of eight, as it turns out. Well, I did that calculation. Then later I found historical data which confirmed that. 
it is 8.5. Not 8, but 8.5. And the thing that, well, the most recent example of a historical confirmation is from uh, Cambodia, interestingly enough. In Cambodia, in the jungles, there is uh, a big complex of Hindu temples called Angkor Wat. Uh, these were originally Vishnu temples. Uh, then they got converted over to Buddhism when one of the kings became a Buddhist, and the whole country became Buddhist. But it's a vast complex of buildings, and it's built using a certain unit. Um, see, the yojana is subdivided into so and so many hastas. A hasta is one cubit, it's like basically from your elbow to the end of your fingers, roughly. But it has an exact length, which would be uh, a 32,000th of the length of the yojana. So if the yojana is 8.5 miles, take a 32,000th of that, and that tells you how long the hasta is. It's about 18 inches, but it's precisely a certain value. Um, that's what they were using in Angkor Wat, that length. Yeah, yeah, um, 32,000 hostas. Well, there's subdivisions into different parts. There's the krosha, four kroshas in a yojana, and, and so forth. So uh, a 32,000th of the 8.5 mile yojana is the unit used to measure all the buildings in Angkor Wat. So it shows that unit was used. And of course, these are Hindu temples. Interestingly enough, they call it the hot. And I was told that hot in Hindi corresponds to hasta in Sanskrit, which is interesting. No, means hand. Right. It is, it, it, hasta means hand also. Just like an elephant is the creature that has a hand, hasta. Hastinapur is the city of the elephants. Uh, it means hand, but in terms of a unit, it actually means from here to here. Uh, and that's the unit that in English is often called the cubit. And by the way, you can trace that to Egypt, and there's a connection with the cubit used in, in Egypt also. And in fact, if you look at the, um, the Great Pyramid, the length of the side of the Great Pyramid is almost exactly 500 of these hastas, the same unit used in Cambodia. But it's very exactly 500. I mean, it's 500.00 something. So the same unit evidently was being used in Egypt, or else it's just a coincidence that it fits exactly 500 times. And then uh, I can give you a whole list of, of coincidences. Uh, you get more and more coincidences, assuming, of course, that everyone really was primitive and they didn't know anything.